Quiet, please. Shh, quiet for the chairman, please. <laughs> Now, in many of the speeches that I've given to the New Right since it commenced, the best part of three to four years ago, one of my roles as a sort of culturally revisionist role, if you like, is to reinterpret and bring back from the past people who have been forgotten. Usually, because I'm bringing them back, I think uh, undeservedly so. For this talk, I'd like to talk about the great sage of Victorian England, who was a Scotsman called Thomas Carlyle. Hey. Thomas Carlyle, one of the greatest writers thinkers and orators in print in British literature and British history. Carlyle has always interested me because of his rootedness in various forms of British tradition and his, his melding them linguistically into forms that spoke to his time. The influence that he had over his era is quite extraordinary. One when bears in mind that he was trained for the Calvinist ministry but rejected uh, Christian faith in a very complicated and theistic sort of way, but remained a profoundly religious man throughout his entire life and cultural creativity. Carlyle in his early years didn't quite know what to do with his life. He thought about uh, the Protestant priesthood and he's rooted in the Protestant tradition in a very radical and transforming manner. He also thought about being a mathematics lecturer and indeed was one for a short time. He then looked at literature and what he could contribute to literature. But he didn't like fictional and poetic forms neat. He wanted to write about philosophical and historical matters, but in a way that was transmuted with a sort of religious energy and an aesthetic zeal. After an early work of mathematics that still exists in an amended textbook form in the United States, he began a long exploration of the cultural channel in the West that was to open up for him his own sensibility that in turn would ramify with his Scottish and Calvinist roots. And this was German literature and German philosophical and idealist literature from the early part to the middle part of the 19th century. It is not an exaggeration to say that he opened up the British and in turn the English mind to Germany and to Germanic culture in his era to such a degree that his reputation suffered a great deal during the 20th century because of his German afar nature. He corresponded directly with Goethe. He, one of his slogans was, close your Byron and open your Goethe. He uh, translated <coughs> Wilhelm Meister, one of Goethe's novels. He wrote four, he translated four volumes of German literature that were published one after the other and that dealt with writers like Richter and with uh, certain of the idealist schools such as Fichte and so on. In these writers, he saw Schelling, in these writers he saw a way to transliterate the spiritual yearnings that he felt in a way that could be communicated, in a manner that could be understood and appreciated by his era. Born in some respects conceptually outside his era, like a seer and a prophet, he came in part to dominate it. It's a strange chronology whereby he begins as an absolute outsider and ends loaded with honours, many of which he chose to reject individually, at the centre of his culture, then to be rejected in the early part of the 20th century because of certain of the authoritarian precepts that he would come to adopt politically uh, in the later middle period and towards the end of his life. His first great literary work is The Philosophy of Clothes, or Sartre Rosatus, which is designed as an exemplification of idealist thought, an introduction of what might be otherwise an obscure or arcane area to English and British audiences, listeners and readers. Don't forget the number of people who could read fluently then was much smaller than now. And the tradition of one person reading to a group, the oral nature of literature, is extraordinarily important to Carlyle. Carlyle's prose style has never really been approximated to by anyone else. There is an extraordinary torrent of allusion and inversion and the use of the dash and the use of epigrammatic insights and a torrent of phrase and of persuasion, nearly always related to a central philosophical idea that underpins the word or lies to one side of it. Carlyle was a religious thinker in a totally secularising manner, in that he spoke to modernity, he spoke to an age of capital and of machines, he spoke to an age of science, but he used the mechanism of the pulpit and the 
jargon and language of Knox, which he transmuted in his own mind into a living and sinuous and prosodic form of narrative that he made all his own. Carlyle's, it was called at the time, and no one really has ever written in that way since. In Sartre, he began to satirise nearly all known conditions, partly as a way of clearing the ground for what he thought ought to replace them at a later day. He also served, by virtue of that text, to introduce German idealist philosophy to an Anglo-Saxon and British audience. He also sought to play games with texts introducing one narrative, one autobiographical fragment, then leaving it, describing religious experience, such as the one that he's believed to have had on the leaf wall, when he had what for him was a mystical experience, whereby he saw the interconnectedness of all things. Carlyle believed in the reality of God in all areas, and at all times, and he believed that all things are interconnected with each other. But in a way, of course, he is reaching way back into the Western and the Greco-Roman tradition. Heraclitus, in his last book on nature, two and a half thousand years ago, believed that energy was the basis of all life, and of all being, and of all becoming, and that that energy was, in some respects, flame. And the idea of the interconnectedness of all matter, and that which describes it, and that which psychologically alludes to it, and that which could be said by certain human values to be above it, was part of Carlyle's vision. This is why he could write about cultural heroes, he could write about chartism, a movement of mass democratic and trade union related reform in the 19th century, which convulsed the masses of that era and ultimately led in part to the democracy we now have in the British Isles. He could also write about the slave trade. His most controversial text in many ways, which is not reprinted in the Penguin Condensed Carlisle, which people are very dubious about in certain respects, laws have been passed which means that even the title of that work I can't mention in a meeting like this. But suffice it to say, John Stuart Mill, his old (laughs) friend and rival, later on, wrote a riposte to it called The Negro Question. And so you can sort of um, adumbrate from that what Carlyle was saying and indeed what the title of that work was. Carlyle believed that life was hierarchical, but that hierarchy had to be based upon the principle of justice. This is why he's uncomfortable reading for the mainstream conservative tradition and for all forms of liberalism and accredited reform. His greatest work after Sartre was the multi-volume French Revolution, the first volume of which was burnt by John uh, Stuart Mill's servant. He was illiterate and thought it was just trash that had been sent to her master. So she thought, oh, this is interesting, and put the whole lot on the fire. You have to understand that, what that means for a writer in the 19th century. There are no word processors. There are no, I'll stick it in this window and give this chap a disc to see what he thinks of it. The whole first volume was burned. This was a blow to Carlyle. It really was. When Mill came to see him, he was white, white as a sheep. And he should have been, to be frank. He offered Carlyle £100, which is a lot of money in the 19th century, to rewrite the first volume. And for a while, Carlyle was stuck. But he soon got into the nature of the work. The French Revolution... Um, is one of the most extraordinary books of the 19th century because for a moment we have to reposition ourselves in that time. For people towards the middle of the 19th century, the French Revolution was an unbelievable experience which had not, never mind revisionism, been assimilated into the knowledge of the middle of the 19th century. The terms left and right, most of the language and discourse that we use in contemporary politics all over the West originates from these extraordinary and tumultuous events Uh, which began with quite sort of um, mild origins towards the latter phase of French monarchicalism in the 18th century. The 19th century remained deeply worried by the chaos and revolutionary ardour and violence that was released at the end of the previous century. Carlyle, unlike almost all other historians who tend to adopt a prosaic, measured, stoical, Johnsonian period in language and in sensibility. History should not be written in white passion. History should not be written in a committed way. Committed not to one side or the other, but committed to the virility and vitality of the thing itself. History, in a sense, should be rather like the Gibbons, the decline and fall of the Roman Empire. It should be judicious, it should be slightly acidic, it should be neutral. Carlyle is never neutral. Carlyle speaks with 
radical Protestant and even re Old Testament fury. Carlyle is always right. And he was an ideologue and in some ways a literary demagogue. And the Victorians were dying for it because internally, under all their progress and all their science and all their industrialism and their vouchsafed Christianity, they were uncertain. They wrote enormous encyclopedias to dock it in a taxonomic way, everything, so that everything could be secured and put in its place. But deep down, as Nietzsche analysed at the end of the 19th century, there was a great subconsciousness of doubt. Carlyle never had any doubt, but he was not a praetor who reached um, any opinion whatsoever, like a barrack room bore. He believed actually in the dialectic of silence for long periods before you spoke. In the French Revolution, he believes that the ancient regime was rotten and that uh, divine judgment was given on France in relation to the revolutionary period. Not a conservative or a sort of right-wing reactionary or monarchical viewpoint. There's a review in France called Riverol, which dates from before the revolution and which later became submerged in the literature of Jean-Marie Le Pen's movement. And this is a sort of whitest or counter-revolutionary documentation that straddles 200 years. These are people who were to the right of the right before the concept of right was thought of. For those not entirely in the know, in the French Revolution, when you formed an assembly, the centre would be the chairman and those who were stood in the middle or sat in the middle. Those to the right of them were those who wanted to conserve the status quo that revolutionary change had reached. Not the status quo and not the prior monarchical arrangement, but the status quo that the revolutionary spasms had reached. Those who were to the left of the chair, the destructive side, as Carlyle calls them, wanted reform. All our terminology of left and right, even though they relate to certain metaphysical and occultistic ideas that predate modernity, nevertheless originates here. And in the belief that the French Revolution is cardinal to Western history, Carlyle achieved a great work, a work of art which is a work of historical science, a work of scholarship, yet a work of passion. The bringing together of things which are thought really never to go together properly. When, if you read Carlyle now, um, you sense an explosion of sensibility, particularly when he's dealing with the terror, dealing with the march of the women, of course, to Versailles, when lots of men, revolutionary men, dress as women and go to Versailles to bring back the king. Um, The extraordinary bread riots in the early years of the revolution and the storming of the Bastille. Carlyle always uses the present tense, always hammers away. You're there. You're right in the middle of it. History is real. Men are being slung to one side. The tumble is rolling. Heads are off on on pipes. It's happening before you. Uh, if you've ever seen the silent film from the 1920s, which has significantly fascistic undertones, called Napoleon by Abel Gonsay, you almost get, in those seething crowd scenes and the split use of the screen, which splits into three by the truculent at the end, you sense the dynamism and movement of Carlyle's prose, the belief that literature isn't a dry academic discourse that's shut off uh, with nerdy people to one side of life, that it's living and cauterised and molten and ferocious, because in a way his his view of the divine is a sort of Protestantism that reaches to a pagan conclusion in spite of itself. The radical nature of Protestantism and its intellectual impact on Anglophone societies, such as Britain and the United States, the reason why culturally we are differentiated from much of continental Europe is because of this intellectual inheritance. One of the interesting things about Carlyle now is that we often think of elements of the post-Protestant tradition, which has led to the liberalism that's all around us, as a burden. Many people in Britain who have radical right views are often Roman Catholics or lax ones or extremely authoritarian ones or they're pagans or they have no faith at all. Interestingly, that Protestant middle, particularly that Anglican soft middle, if you like, is often radically underrepresented. And yet, in a way, although it's Calvinistic in origin, Carlyle's diction and attitude and mentality enables us to look in a positive way at elements of the radical individualism and granite-like metaphysical objectivism and authority of purpose that a profound individual mind can have. Protestantism, in a sense, has two distinct roads to travel from his day to ours. One is the liberal modernity that exists all around us, and if you want to see it, you just go out into Hoban now. The other 
is a reconnection with the Greeks and the world that existed even before Christianity. You explode into Carlisle and Kierkegaard, you explode out into Nietzsche, you explode out towards the end of the 19th century outside of Christianity itself. But these essentially were constructive men. Carlisle loathed the destructive in the human mind and in society. That's why he is deeply an anti-leftist thinker, if he is anything. The revolution revealed an enormous panoply of destructive energy, but he believed that it's the purpose of leadership to galvanise, to straggle, and to direct those energies when they occur. One of the criticisms that's been levelled against Carlyle's books as they go on, after the French Revolution, to reposition and re-evaluate historical figures, to write about the movements and social ideologies of his time, to engage in a form of revisionism in relation to Mohammed, in relation to Oliver Cromwell, in relation to all sorts of figures who in some ways were minor cultural hate figures in his era that he got people to look at again in another way, in the teeth of much cultural opposition. Gradually he split from many of his liberal friends, such as John Stuart Mill, with endless denunciations of utilitarian, as he called it. One of Carlyle's great strengths is his belief that language is a new thing. You don't necessarily go against the order of grammar, but you a genius reinvents in the crucible of creation. He developed more words, more neologisms than almost anyone in his time. He also, in his book about slavery, pointed out that half of the white children who lived in Britain at that time died before they were five. And yet moralists and idealists, many of them factory owners, were concerned about the West Indies. In some ways, that tactic of textual refusal and aggression is part of an old Tory satirical tradition. The text that most reminds me of his book about slavery, which I think was published in Edinburgh's Phrases magazine in 1849, I'm remembering from memory here, is Swift's modest proposal that the Irish, in relation to the prospect of famine, should eat their own young, cannibalistically. That is often interpreted in a literal-minded way, when, of course, these thinkers are often extreme and metaphorical, and wish to throw ideas upon a canvas in order to bring things out more starkly and with greater aesthetic virility. It was quite funny, actually, because in the uh, 1970s, RTE, which is the broadcaster in the south of Ireland, broadcast Swift's a modest proposal, and it led to a fist fight amongst literati in the studio as they rolled around because they interpreted it as a literal insult against the Irish people, when in actual fact it's an attack on British policy in Ireland. That's the danger that you get into when you use politics as metaphor and as extreme literary statement. But Carlyle loved being in century. He loved dialectic, divisiveness and debate. He, in a sense, luxuriated in conflict and in the latter stages of the French Revolution, you sense attention, particularly when he deals with the late period of the Terror, which he sees always as a judgment upon France and upon the French, and an extenso upon the West. Many of his phrases that historians use now were coined then. The notion that Robespierre is sea green in his incorruptibility. When Robespierre was dragged to the guillotine with a smashed mouth, and with his brother in tow, and with the other terrorists with him, the terroristic adolescent, Sujust, the crippled Couthon who wanted to guillotine everyone else, and when they were all dragged by the Thermidorian reaction to the scaffold, um, the tumbrils were beating, Ribspear went under the guillotine, the mobs that had cheered the ones that he'd done down, including his own revolutionary colleagues, Camel Desmoulin, slightly to the right of Ribspear's factions, the Albertists at the Paris Commune or Town Hall, slightly to the left. Carlyle is there as real novelistic presence in history. Contemporary academicism, which in a strange way, because of various postmodern ideas which are now which have been current in the West for the last thirty years, now elevates Carlyle to a new status, have always feared his ne- his partiality, the fact that there is no neutrality in his view of creation because he believes that all creation is divine, that it is all interconnected, and that it all has a meaning and purpose. The problem, as Nietzsche would have pointed out later, is perspectivalism. It may all have a meaning and purpose, perspectivalism. It may all have a meaning and purpose, but almost each coherent and literate historian will attribute a different one to it. Carlyle leaves many of those problems unresolved. But in his idea of open-mindedness towards the text, and towards history, and towards historical documentation... There is something extraordinarily liberating 
History is regarded as a subject by many people as a bore, something to get through, something which isn't really alive, something that doesn't relate to them. The interesting thing about him is his belief in its living quality. These people are speaking ethical lessons to us from the past, but they're as alive as we are now. Now, as he became the sage of Victorian England, and as he excoriated Victorian capitalism and laissez-faire individualism more and more, many of his more liberal-minded friends from the early days began to move away from him. It's important also to realise that by the middle of his life, he was a cultural lion. He knew virtually everybody who was of any significance in the culture of his day. Dickens used to carry around a multi-volume set of the French Revolution, and once told a friend, when I want to think something, I just fish it out and have a look at one of the volumes. It had a sort of totemic effect on many people in the area in which he was alive. And bearing in mind, this is a man who would later be um, cynically put down by the Bloomsbyite group at the beginning of the 20th century as an uneducated Scotch peasant lecturing to the rest of us on the basis of his extreme Protestant morality. Um, Carlyle became a partly demonic figure in the uh, 20th century because he's regarded as proto-fascistic. The last book Hitler ever read was his volume, the... Uh, eight or six volume history of Frederick the Great six and Frederick the Great's ability amidst chaos on the battlefield to construct endless forms of order the interesting thing about Carlyle is he thinks that micrologically and at the lowest possible level at the grain of sand the universe entire is revealed so an individual decision made by a general or monarch on a battlefield has relevance to the way in which you make decisions about the ordering of energy in society way outside of the, of the area of the battlefield or even the war that they're actually fighting, the result of which, to his way of thinking, is often less important than the cardinal or ordinating or prior principle which an authoritarian leader of genius brings to the chaos of creating new forms. In a way, he has a sort of titanic and Olympian view. He's less concerned about the ideological niceties of Oliver Cromwell of Muhammad, of Shakespeare as a cultural leader, than their ability to corral and restore, to give energy to certain circumstances, to bring energy to fruition in text and human behaviour. One of the reasons why the postmodernists and post-structuralists who are a school in late 20th century academicism, particularly in the arts, like him, is because of his open-mindedness to the interconnection between texts and life, and the ability to see texts as living and volcanic documents. During his high middle period, he produced a whole series of texts, such as Past and Present, and Heroes and Hero Worship, and Latter-day Pamphlets, in which he looked at almost every element of contemporary Victorian life. He looked at slavery, he looked at democracy, he looked at imperialism, he looked at the emancipation of women, he looked at extremities of poverty and wealth, he looked at industrialisation and laissez-faire economics, which was then becoming de rigueur. He believed that the modern world would become atomised, would become spiritless, would become falsely individualist, would become completely material, and would lose its connection with what he perceived of as the divine. His attitude towards religion is complicated, deeply personal, rooted, and idiosyncratic. He believes that he does believe in a spiritual dimension beyond life, which he believes he's actually experienced in a personal revelation. He could have only experienced this as a personal, personal revelation because, in a sense, such a viewpoint is so personal that its truth positive can't really be communicated. The effects of that experience on Carlyle, the belief that everything is interconnected, means that the smallest and the highest moment are of equal significance to the possibility of the whole, even in their inequality. He believes that unfairness... Uh, inequality are rooted as part of nature and natural becoming. Does he believe that God is nature? Not entirely. He's not totally pagan in that way. His conception, as far as I can see it, is a metaphysical objectivism where there are certain criteria, beauty, truth, justice, that lie outside man and prior to man. And that, like most of the religious thinkers of the past, these are objective in that they are not perspectival, and they can't be reduced to contemporary human standards. But very like Nietzsche, in a way, the way in which we perceive these absolutes, the full knowledge of which we can't have any idea of in our own personhood, in our own individuality, is to struggle towards truth 
and becoming in the moment in which we find ourselves. When the peasant demands bread at the height of the riots, when the physiocratic economic system was collapsing, just so prior to the revolution in 1789, he is demanding, in Carlyle's view, justice in his society. The point of aristocracy is to rule in accordance with laws and the development of the creative evolution of human society. If a ruling group fails in its obligation to rule, all the privileges and the flummery that go with it, which means very little to a Spartan conscience like him, goes by the way, and they're cast aside by history, and a new group is brought in. Carlyle is not a conservative, but in some respects is a revolutionary conservative of a sort. So the idea that a leadership can fail and needs to be dispensed with the opposition, in a sense, to what you might call an English Tory view, that no matter how bad it is, a leadership should always be kept going because it's bound to be slightly better than what might replace it. Tolstoy's view that revolutionaries are always the worst because they come to power new and hungry and you don't quite know what they're going to do. Carlyle believes in the prospect of absolute change, but it's change rooted in tradition, which if it devours its own children, like the Greek titans, will prove to be worthless in the way that the... Montanards were useless and worthless, in his opinion, at the end of the French Revolution. The Montanards are the mountain in the convention, the most revolutionary of the French Revolutionary Assemblies. The first was the, uh, well, the ancient monarchical regime, the ancient regime of its estates. You had the third estates with the first uh, assembly. Then you had the constitutional assembly morphing into the uh, legislative assembly. Then you had the French assembly to this day, it's called the National Assembly, of course, and it's rooted in the ideas of this period. Then you have the convention, the one that all students of this period, if they ever read this period at school, understand. The convention consists of the moderate revolutionaries to one side of the chair, the right, the centre sweeping into the left, and the extreme left. It was called the mountain because they had the highest seats. And in the highest seats there was Maximilien Robespierre, there was Danton, there was Desmoulin, there was Couthon, there was saint Just. There were the others, the terrorists. Robespierre began with a pamphlet saying he abhorred the death penalty and ended up synonymous with its use. At the high point of the terror, 1,200, 1,400 were being physically guillotined in the centre of Paris, including many of his old revolutionary colleagues. And he would stand there with a perfumed handkerchief and mop his brow and mop his mouth and say, it's for progress. It's for liberation. It's for France. Because don't forget... Many of the forms of extreme leftism that existed at that time were infused with nationalism and with national power. Until the middle of the 19th century, certain liberal ideas and nationalism, of course, went together against traditional, conservative, monarchical forms of order. Within decades, conservative uh, nationalism and liberalism would have become dire political enemies. Carlyle is writing at a time not of confusion, but of voltaic energy and becoming. His revisionism about Cromwell is truly extraordinary, because Cromwell was unbelievably hated at the time that he began on uh, Oliver Cromwell's Rye speeches and uh, his attempt to exemplify them. It's interesting the way he often deals with texts. In Sartre Rosatis, there's a sort of text which he stands to one side of, plunges into the middle of. His transubstantiatory religious experience at the Leith Walk is actually deeply embedded in the middle of that text, but it's presented in some ways as though it's happened to somebody else. In his book on slavery, it's a document that's left for somebody else to find. These are extraordinarily modernist and postmodernist experiments in using your own voice, throwing your own voice as a form of cultural ventriloquism, speaking to other people. In the French Revolution, he allows everyone to act. Do you remember those old films of the Soviet Revolution? By Eisenstein and these sorts of pieces. They're almost like puppet films. They're amazing in silence. So you have the masses speak, and they wave their fists in the air, and then they run in one direction. On battleship Potemkin, the soldiers run in, the soldiers run in another area, and so on. It's almost as if there's an attempt to make Marxist theory and the idea of historical progress real at the point of progress real at the point at which masses move and act. There's this extraordinary moment, just as cinematography, when the nurse holds up the dead child, and she herself is shot by the white troops in a battleship Potemkin on the steps as the soldiers come down with their bayonets. And I always sense there is something pre-cinematic about here, Carlyle's writing about history. Now, in the repositioning of Cromwell, he 
He's not concerned about certain ideological matters that might interest hear or about people hear about Cromwell. He's interested in the idea of a man, particularly comes out of the extreme Protestant dispensation, an Englishman, of course, an English revolutionary, who changes the reality of his society and his time through an act of will and does so in relation to foregrounded moral ideas. Political action which is not based upon personal conviction to Carlyle is always worthless and better not to try. Now, as his career goes on, he becomes more of a sage, more looked to, more hostile to the extreme forms of capitalism that are developing all around him in England. One of the most extraordinary things about him, although Dickens does it as well to a degree, is he's so aware of the raw energy of England then, like China now. Pollution everywhere, exploitation everywhere, enormous amounts of wealth everywhere, extreme poverty everywhere. The, the radicalism of that society and the sort of striving and creation of gold out of the ground and new classes of men, tough-faced men from the north of England and elsewhere, who, who were titans. Theodore Dreiser wrote a book um, in the early part of the 20th century in America called The Titan about these entrepreneur and factory owners who almost come from nothing and within one generation are sitting in Parliament, peers, calling the shots for the entire society and its empire. Carlyle was an imperialist, but he believed it should be based upon certain moralities of form. He was a nationalist in certain respects, and yet at the same time, his feeling for nationality was very complex, aesthetic, very like Kipling's in Recessional, in many ways. A profound, reactionary and yet rebellious spirit, whereby you looked at things, sought to meld them and move them in accordance with the energy of the hour, and always sought to find divine purpose in the actions of men. Where he found that there wasn't such, he moved away. Now, or he uh, didn't give it cultural endorsement. It's um, I mean, a great talker, a great raconteur, a great celebrity in a period uh, where celebrity meant something slightly different to what it means today. There's a famous incident in which uh, a woman at a salon said to Carlyle, I do believe, Mr. Carlyle, she said, in the idea of the interconnectedness of the universe. And Carlyle rumbled, rumbled in reply, you better in a Scotch accent, because he was quite a character. He was a sort of... the most extraordinary religious uh, and uh, literary incendiary that this society produced in the 19th century. Now, towards the end of his life, he wanted to find one ruler in relation to the chaos of Victorian modernity who he could posit as a counterbalance and wait. Frederick the Great of Prussia was for him in his ideological way of looking at the literary text of his area of that monarch's life, a way of exploring the idea of benevolent dictatorship. Carlyle is opposed to democracy. Carlyle doesn't believe in rule by majority. Carlyle doesn't believe in coherent, stratified, old style ruled by aristocracy. Certainly not an aristocracy that does not reform and certainly an aristocracy that has no concern paternally for the plight of the people, particularly at the bottom. His sort of socialism, socialistic and solidarist beliefs are inegalitarian and always elitist. Because morality and will and vigour and power comes from above to below in all areas of life. But those at the top have to be worthy of ruling those at the bottom. Otherwise, in his opinion, they will be judged by history. As he, became, as he got older, he became, in contemporary terms, and in terms that he'd used himself, more and more right-wing. And he prefigures some of the authoritarian and social movements um, of, the, of the 20th century, for whom, in many ways, he was an illuminating character. It's interesting to note that many of the great figures, Arnold, Ruskin, Morris, many of them alleged champions of the left, many a faceless tower block called Morris, block or something was put up by old labour in the 1960s and so on. Yet in many ways, these romantics, these socialists, these conceptual pre raphaelite types, these neo-medievalists, were actually looking back to past orders of social organicism. They weren't looking forward to the modern left. They were actually, in some ways, quasi-right-wing individuals who have been repositioned, falsely positioned as neo-leftists in the early part of the 20th century. Carlyle is part of the authoritarian right-wing tradition, 
He's also a figure that uniquely can be used in British terms, in British circumstances. Many uh, people who are just concentric to these islands wonder where are quote-unquote Nietzsche's, where are figure of indomitable literary power and glory might be, where are sort of um, a combination, if you like, of sort of Jack London and Nietzsche in certain respects, where are figures? I, as a modest proposal of my own, unlike Swift's, would put forward the idea of Thomas Carlyle as a man who, in the translations of German idealism, in his book upon the philosophy of clothes, which rips them away and shreds utilitaria and demands a spiritual dimension to the complications of early 19th century life, to his analysis of the French Revolution as the climatrac of that period, of the period in which his sensibility was formed, in relation to his desire to even preserve the existence of slavery, whereby he looked back to the ancient world and analysed the enormous numbers of forms, don't forget serfdom in Russia wasn't abolished until the 1860s, that inequality and service takes in all forms of societies, ancient, modern and medieval. In his, re- in his attempt to explicate the medieval world, where he sees in a medieval abbot a sort of integratedness of life, a solemnity and a stoicism of purpose that moderns lack, that modern society for many is alienated, is broken down, is inorganic, is increasingly meaningless. The great thing about a lot of these 19th century sages is that they are talking to us. They are talking to what internally the modern West has become, even though they're 100, 150 years out of date, quote unquote. The interesting thing is the most advanced European intellectuals realised many of the crises that were going to come for our civilization long before it began to dawn on mass consciousness that our old religion would collapse. But as Nietzsche said at the end of the 19th century, that will be a liberation, certainly for certain elite spirits, but it will also be a great burden for the majority because it's left them bereft. It's left them with nothing. It's left them in the culture of the ruins and the ruins of culture. The extreme right in the 20th century was one of the formulations whereby we attempted to reconstitute certain of the hollowness that existed in the modernity which has come down to us. An extreme alliance of bedfellows who were completely at variance with each other as their subsequent warfare showed, namely the ultra-capitalist, most Western powers of all, and communism combined to destroy it. And we are in some ways culturally amidst hyper-modernity, living in the ruins. But Carlyle's work, from his analysis of the stoicism and mental and moral and linguistic integration of a medieval abbot in comparison to a modern factory owner, to his hostility to modern democracy where the masses are bought, bought and sold shoddy packages and lied to perpetually by politicians who change their opinion in an instant, in parliaments that have little or no moral integrity and are based upon no philosophical precepts at all, in relation to an aesthetics and an architecture which even in his era he perceived as inferior to the past. He speaks to us now through his revolutionary energy, through his use of Protestant diction, for his respect for the individual. The Western culture begins and ends with a supreme individual mind. It's partial. It's nominalist. It's perspectival. It looks at life from the perspective, hopefully heroic, of a coherent individuality. It often doesn't say it has the whole truth, but it is participatory to the explication and evolutionary revelation of the prospect of the truth. And these are men are the great geniuses of our civilization. They don't have every answer, but they open up a plenitude of partially answered questions, the nature of which you need questions the nature of which you need to completely resolve before you can step on to something more. All of our great thinkers are shooting arrows into the future. And Carlyle is one of them. 30 books, not including the reminiscence of his his wife, Jane Carlyle, not including uh, paraphernalia and uh, the biography he never wanted to have written, not including the notes, apocrypha and, and letters. The enormous and Herculean energy to produce that in the teeth of much cultural opposition at the time. Don't forget, he was denouncing what liberal Victorian values were. 
Industrialisation, ugliness, uh, contempt for the environment, contempt for what he perceived to be the spiritual dimension of man. He's not concerned with suffering because can, can suffering can ennoble. But it's the meaning that's attributed to it and the feeling that in the industrialisation the suffering of the masses have been rendered somehow meaningless. It's the sort of aesthetic squalor with its attendant moral bankruptcy which appalled him. He is a moralist. But the interesting thing about the great thinkers in our tradition is he's not a moralizer. He's not wagging his finger. He's excoriating. He's a sort of man on a mountain who is telling you what he thinks. At the end of Zarathustra, Nietzsche says, the Persian sage of old comes down from the mountain and walks in the valleys prior to going up into the mountains again. Why does he choose Zoroaster Zarathustra? Because he's a dualist and because Nietzsche wants to overcome dualism. So he uses one of its oldest Aryan spokesmen to overcome that particular rigidity in thought. Zarathustra has two pets, a snake and an eagle. And the eagle is courage and the snake, sometimes a synonym for sexuality in most cultures, stands for knowledge. Knowledge and courage. What does a man need in this life but knowledge and courage? And then he goes out into the morning to experience a great noontide. Not the end of the day, not the sorrow and the tiredness of the dark, not yet the beginning, but the noontide when the sun is up and life is golden and there is a future. And many of our great thinkers contribute step by step to the nature of that future. All of Carlyle's texts now exist on the internet, in other forms, there are American paperback editions of nearly all of them bound together, from the translation of the German I Germanic idealists through to an analysis of John Knox and the Norwegian kings, <coughs> through to his analysis of the people that he knew in his own life, to his own personal relationships, and to the nature of the French Revolution. An extraordinary text. When I uh, did a little history, you were taught Sabul, who's a Trotskyist, and you were taught the Fevre, who's a Marxist, and you were taught Jure, who's a 19th century socialist. Occasionally some conservative bird or whatever he was called, would be allowed in to sort of wave a sort of white flag for the Ancien regime before being silenced. But no one ever even mentioned Carlyle and his revolutionary and impressionistic work, The French Revolution. It exists in paperback in the Cambridge University Press, in uh, the Oxford University Press classics, Sartre does as well. All of the books are available. There's an excellent hardback bibliography by that uniquely American school of the sort of Oxford University Press where a German-American scholar with extraordinary refinement and passionate attention to detail details every book that was ever published under Kalal's name and or in print in the 19th century. This work is all available and it's heroic and vitalist literature. He's too opinionated for anyone to agree with. And he's the sort of person that you will occasionally read and you will want to throw the book across the room. But that doesn't matter because he wants that response. He would prefer radical negation than indifference because in his way of looking at things pantheistically up to a point, indifference is the worst form of hatred. So I give as an Englishman the great Scottish genius, Thomas Carlyle, read him and no more. Thank you very much. Yeah, this, this isn't um, a question about the main thrust of the talk. It's about, you mentioned his unusual uh, diction, uh, his unusual use of language. Yes. I'm going to go back and read him. I've read him a little bit before, but I didn't understand him before. Um, but the use of the dash, there are two other writers that I'm very interested in who I know to be connected with each other who use the dash. Two other geniuses in the, in the English language. And one was Stern, Lawrence Stern, yes. and uh, who I can't see... Carl I having liked after that talk. And one is Wyndham Lewis, yes, who I think probably did like Carl I'm saying, yes. Um, although I don't remember. Uh, he probably says something about Carl at some point. But in fact, in some of Wyndham Lewis's later work, like Rotting Hill, he, he explicitly talks about this sort of Carlisle. I imagine you're familiar with what I'm talking oh, about. Yeah, so yes, okay. So, uh, could 
If I ever came back to England, would you do one on Wyndham Lewis? I don't, I've done a talk on Wyndham Lewis before, but I can always do another one. Wait, wait, you haven't recorded? Yeah, it's on the internet. Oh, so really? I'll give you the details later. Oh, my yes, God. Yes, there's... The you really Dash. Lewis is, is another great. Oh, yes, very much so. Yeah. And when uh, Lewis liked Carlyle uh, in a reaction to the Bloomsbury's who hated him, right. and it was sought to direct the culture in another direction. Yeah. But Lewis, Lewis likes Stern. There, there, there are actually hints to that. Yes, but Stern's a sort of a satirist, and there's a strong element of revulsion in Carlyle. Revulsion uh, before acceptance. Right. Because there has to be a negation before you can say something positive. Nietzsche's very similar. If you notice the career... Half of it is a rejection of the ideas we found around him. Right. Then you get to Zarathustra, and there's an enormous reconstitution. Because the one interesting thing about all of these thinkers is they're creative. Right. If you look at most literature now, it's destructive. It's cynical. It's uh, Beckettian. Man is a worm. Man is on the ground. He wants to tear. They want to tear down. Whereas these people may tear down because there's certain things they want to tear down, but they want to build up. They want to reconstitute. They want to transgress. Uh, beyond the possibility of the present day. We had a talk on cosmotheism earlier, and one of the things that's most remarkable about our people is, whether they're religious or not, transcendence. It's the idea of going beyond that which exists now. When you walk into the Gothic cathedrals and so on, you look up and you see the vaulting, and you see that which is above you. You see air and the desire to fill that space with glory and go above and not to be tied down. And that's the sort of religious urge that nearly all European people with any sensibility really have. Whatever belief system they have, whatever the language they have to express it, it's that desire for it. To come back to your point about the dash, I think it's a desire to break, if you like, the very classical sentence with its periods and its idea of balance. This idea, you say one statement, and then you say another, yeah. and then you end in the middle. Because isn't it English to always be in the middle and to be safe? And to be balanced, whereas these people are radical and want to push. So there is a connection. There is a connection. Even between Stern. Because morality and grammar go together. Right, of course. Um, One question at the back. Yes, thank you, John, for a very entertaining and excellent. Here, here. Here, here. Because I hear every word you say. But what I want to say now is this. But when you come to a sense of English word, you can always use the French. Yes. Yeah, Yeah, I just, the word you didn't want to say, I just can't figure what it could be. I mean, this is a problem. I can't remember what I say, this is instantaneous. It's a problem I can't (laughs) figure out. The forbidden cycle. Um, yes, uh, oh, yes. It's a, it's so you, you create a bigger bond, problem yeah. for yourself by saying that word, perhaps? Um, oh, in a political meeting, yes. It's a, it's a word that rap artists, uh, in quotation marks, use all the time. Uh, begins with N and ends with R. <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, and the irony is that there wasn't been passed to put people in prison who used that word in this country. Wait, wait, does it apply to American tourists? <laughs> uh, you're covered by the First Amendment. <laughs> here? Not here. Are we not allowed to be today the nigger of the Narcissus? Oh, I know, but uh, I noticed. Well, let's put it this way there's, there's a film which, of course, celebrates the Allies of the Second World War, and it's called The Dam Busters. That's right. Yeah. And one of the officers has a dog, yeah. which is of a certain yes. colour. Labrador. And the BBC, in their wisdom, in the last mistake broadcaster in Britain, in the last couple of years, you can syncopate the signal. So he doesn't call his dog what he calls him. He says, ah, here he is. And the dog comes along with a ball, you know, and he says, it's... <laughs> because they don't even believe people can hear the word when everyone knows what the word is. And there's hundreds of rap bands on the internet who are chanting right. out the word, right. chanting out the word, yes. nine to the dozen. But the interesting thing about that text is Carlyle knew it would create enormous problems, even in that era, even in that era, when he backed the governor of Jamaica over putting down riots there, uh, airy, yeah. air, when he backed, um, well, and John Stuart Mill formed a committee to have him arrested and tried. Uh, uh, the beginning of this idea that war crimes are done and you must try people after the fact in emergency situations. All of these things which come to fruition in the wars of the 20th century have their precursors in earlier liberal orders. Don't forget liberalism was once a minority position. They once used to meet in semi-secret. They had little handshakes for each other. As opposed to, to, of course, when we come to power, we'll try people in advance. (laughs) (laughs) Yes, yes, well... 
Um, and <laughs> one more question, bearing in mind the finitude of the room. Just that, um, in my encounter, several mentions of Carlisle. Yes. I had a high regard for Carlisle. What would Carlisle's view of it be? Well, that's <laughs> um, I think I think it's there's great respect for. Well, he doesn't talk about Napoleon very much. It's interesting, but there's great respect for Titanic leaders who bring together great strands of energy and try and mould things progressively for their own people. If his reputation died less in Germany than at any time. Certain people have been mentioned already in the questions. Stern, Lewis, Carlisle, Carlisle obviously because of the talk. It's noticeable that all of their reputations took a hammering in the 20th century. And they all took a hammering in the 20th century. Don't forget, Carlisle was virtually a cultic figure in the 19th century. People... Um, Do they have his bust? Like, stack oh, bust yes, well, there used to be pil pilgrimages up to... This is an Englishman, is it? Eccle... 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 My father yes, in the when I was 14. And you could sign the book, and so on, like a, a holy figure, essentially. And in the 20th century, mid-20th century, they dipped down because he was a racist, because he was allegedly an elitist, he was anti-democratic, he was Germanophile, he was all these appalling things that we needed to get away from, and so on, as it was perceived. Because, of course, for the identity out there... Patriotic British people define their Britishness in part in an anti German way right. and have been taught to do so. So, because of Britain's history in the 20th century. And Carlyle believed that actually, as in some ways a Celt, as that extraordinary sort of, um, his father was a stonemason, that sort of that independence of mind of the craft as a group, you've got a group that doesn't have capital but has great learning or has the capacity for developing it. So, you have a sort of economically independent radical individualism of mind. You know what I was thinking of when you talked about his approach to history as a living thing? I, I thought for some strange reason about David Hume and, and his, his, you know, his, his, approach, his approach to how we can know historical truth and also his theory of mind in which he keeps talking about force and vivacity. Yes, as a sensual Western... It, it seems European to me that that, that that's that's Carlyle, according to you, force and five aspects. Yes, and meaning comes from that. It's um, it's hostility to passivity, right. to hostility to received wisdom. To know the past is to experience it, and the only way we can experience it is textually. He would probably like the postmoderns considered film and all the ways in which we now view an image of the past as other texts. And um, wait, wait, aren't they? Yes, they are. But that was. A very radical notion in his era. And the interesting thing to me is that Carlyle... There's been a great boom in Carlyle studies and Victorian studies at the end of the 20th century because what people are doing is confaced with the dilemmas that we now have. They're reaching back to these great yes. figures yes. who were <coughs> blocked out from the middle of the 20th century. Well, we have Lewis, one, Lewis one is still question. blocked out. Pretty much. Although, for those who are interested... An exhibition of all of his portraits begins tomorrow at the National Portrait Gallery in Trafalgar Square. Wait, 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 wait. Okay, okay, I have to go. One last question. You didn't finish the gentleman's question that he asked you. You did that His view on, like, Frederick the Great. In the end, one can't know, but he would have probably considered him to be a great leader in the European tradition, which is a blasphemous view now. Those are the most blasphemous view of all. I gather a waxworks to swords of Hitler is being produced there, which is going on show this other week. Someone tore the head off. No, it, yeah, it was really? vandalised today. Really? Yeah. Oh. yeah. Well, Somebody he ripped did the head off. Besides, they, they made him look <laughs> old. And, they did him in the bunker. He's all broken yes. down. Oh, yes. Uh, that was, um, it's sort of, uh, I think a, a, a German-Jewish civic leader said on Thursday in the Times, as long as it demystifies him, we're in favour. <laughs> So, of that to sort exhibit. Can I just point out the book uh, yeah. of Hitler? Yes. Oh, yes, he did. Um, which, his, his letters to, uh, uh, to and from Ezra Pham have been edited by Omar Pham, Ezra's son. Es yeah. Ezra's son is Omar Pham. I once attended a meeting of the Winterberg Society, Society which has partly kept his name alive in the barren years, and I said, when's... Uh, the society going to part um, finance the republication of Hitler. And they went, 
no, no, we'll do the vulgar streak, we'll do Rotting Hill, we'll do the Apes of God, we'll do Tar, we'll do the Human Mage, but we're Snooty not Baronet. doing Hitler, we're not doing um, Pale Face, we're not doing Count Your Dead, They Are Alive, we're not doing all those ones, you know. So you said, but 75 years, and you can publish what you want. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Wow. I was just going to say, uh, William Joyce, Lord Warhol, used the code name Carlisle during the war. I don't know how many of you might know that. That's the yes. 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 yes, it's an interesting... It's sort of, um, you... <laughs> what side would people have adopted long after they're dead? In the end, one can't know. But one can sense the cultural partiality and sympathy that they would have. And the truth is, he wouldn't have been brandished, he wouldn't have been neglected, he wouldn't have been marginalised had people thought he was a liberal who wanted to include everyone and believe that everything was equal and vote to decide everything. There's no more of them than us. There's only us. Thank you very much. Bravo.